All right, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jeffrey Salant, and I am the HOA Information Officer for the Division of Real Estate, which is a division of the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies, also known as DORA. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the applicability of the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act, also known as CCIOA or CIOA. Uh, here to help us understand this application is attorney Travis Keenan. Travis is a partner with the law firm Vile Fotheringham LLP uh, and focuses his practice on nonprofit corporate governance, covenant enforcement, collections, foreclosures, governing document interpretation and review, uh, general litigation, uh, easements and land use rights, boundary disputes, special improvement districts, FHA compliance, and landlord tenant disputes. Travis has been representing and advising community associations since 2009, and when he's not working or spending time with his wife and kids, he enjoys cooking, gardening, and speeding down a mountain on skis or a mountain bike. There are five handouts attached to this webinar, a PDF copy of this presentation, a full copy of Kiowa, as well as an edited version of Kiowa that has only those provisions that are applicable to pre-Kiowa communities, a couple of short lists of just the provisions in Kiowa that are applicable and inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities, and a very helpful decision flowchart to assist you in determining if your community uh, falls under Kiowa. You may download these handouts by clicking on the blue links located under the handouts tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. Today's presentation, as well as all of the handouts, will also be uploaded to the division's YouTube channel later today. Please note that the information provided during this presentation is for educational purposes only, and it's not meant to provide or can be construed as legal advice. Any legal questions should be directed to your attorney. And before we get into the presentation topics, I want to take a brief moment to talk with you about my office, the HOA Information and Resource Center. The HOA office is a statutorily created office, and my position, the HOA Information Officer, is appointed by the Director of the Division of Real Estate. Per statute, the HOA office provides information to homeowners regarding their basic rights and responsibilities under Kiowa. Uh, it gathers and analyzes reports, information through complaints and HOA registration. And we also write an annual report each year to the legislature. We create resource materials, provide education and presentations such as this one. And we maintain a website with information for the public uh, and registering HOAs. As for what my office does not do, uh, the HOA office is not a regulatory program. We do not mediate or arbitrate. We cannot provide legal advice. We do not act as an advocate. We cannot assess fines or penalties, and we do not enforce an HOA's failure to register. Well, that is all from me this morning. Travis, if you're all set, I will hand over control of the presentation to you. Sounds good, Jeff. All right. Oh, excuse me. Travis, you should now be the presenter. Okay. Um... One um, moment here. No uh, worries. Okay. Travis, on the left side of your uh, control panel, you should see um, the ability to share your screen just next. Okay. All right. I should be on my first slide and it should be in the slideshow mode. Is it in the slideshow mode, Jeff? It, it sure is, Travis. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And I will confess that I learned a few things in the process of preparing this presentation, and I hope you can all say the same once we're done going through it. Uh, so the presentation today is the applicability of Kiowa, all of it, some of it, or none of it, 
and why does it matter? I'd like to start with just some basic vocabulary that I think should help everybody uh, understand the presentation today. So as Jeff mentioned, we're talking about the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act, which I'll refer to as Kiowa. And that's the Colorado state law governing common interest communities. The statutory uh, site is Colorado Revised Statutes, sections 38-33.3, 101, all the way to section 401. That you know, includes uh, you know, about 70 various sections in between those two uh, bookends there. And uh, for this presentation, I'm really just talking about Kiowa, no other state laws. So when I say uh, Section 101, I mean Colorado Revised Statute Section 38-33.3-101. And that little nifty symbol right there, if you can see my cursor, is the section symbol. Now, a common interest community and I'll abbreviate that as a CIC at times on the slides today, is a real estate described in a declaration that also requires the owner of that real estate to pay for expenses related to other real estate. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail momentarily. But for now, uh, you should also know that there are three types of common interest communities. There's condominiums, there's cooperatives and there's planned communities. A condominium is distinguished from the other types of, of communities by the fact that the common areas are owned jointly and severally by the individual unit owners. And that's a construct of the Declaration of Covenants. So if you're wondering whether your community is a condominium or, or you know, something else, go to the Declaration of Covenants look to see who owns the common areas. If the common areas are owned jointly and severally by the individual unit owners, then it's a condominium. If the association owns the common areas, it's in all likelihood a planned community. So the, the second type of common interest community is a cooperative. And in a cooperative, all the real property is owned by the association. There's no individually owned units but an owner's membership in the association entitles them to exclusive possession of a unit. Cooperatives are not a focus of today's presentation. I'll make a couple mentions of cooperatives, but this type of community is rarely used in Colorado, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it today. The third and final type of community is a planned community, and it's basically a catch-all. It's a common interest community that is not a condominium or a cooperative. Uh, your typical you know, planned community that, that people would think of would, would be your you know, typical single family home community that you know, maybe has a pool or a small park as a common area that is owned by the association. And again, that's kind of the distinguishing factor between a, a condominium and a planned community is that in the planned community, the association owns the common areas. In the condominium, the owners own the common areas in undivided shares. So Kiowa. Kiowa became effective on July 1st, 1992, and it applies to common interest communities. Now, there's a potential issue that the legislature had to address when they enacted a statute like this in that, that there already were common interest communities here in Colorado, and the Colorado Constitution prohibits retrospective laws. And that is a, a term of art, retrospective. If it's uh, deemed to be, you know, retroactive and also fails the, the court's two-part test, then it's called retrospective and it, it's you know disallowed. And as I said, there's a two-part test to determine whether a retroactive law is unconstitutionally retrospective. First, the court will ask whether 
there's a vested right that's being affected. And second, if there is a vested right, the court will balance the vested right versus public policy. And I apologize that uh, text got a little cut off there. Should have reversed the order of those images. But um, essentially, you know, if a, the legislature is going to pass a law that's going to affect existing rights, you know, courts are going to scrutinize it and determine whether they think it's fair. So that is what caused us to have some of these exceptions to Kiowa in part. Now there are three primary exceptions to Kiowa that I'm gonna to discuss today. There are those communities that are non-common interest communities. And as I mentioned before, if it's not a common interest community, then Kiowa is not going to apply at all. Then there are what we call the pre-Kiowa communities. Those communities that were created through the filing of a Declaration of Covenants on or before July 1st, 1992. And pre-Kiowa communities are subject to the majority of Kiowa, actually, uh, but they're you know, accepted from, from portions of Kiowa. And finally, there are the small planned communities or limited expense planned communities, which are subject to only a very select few provisions from Kiowa. There are some other exceptions that we're really not going to get into today very much. Uh, there are some limited exceptions for large planned communities that have, you know, over 500 uh, acres and over 200 residential units, I believe, uh, and also commercial units, um, those communities are subject to some exceptions. Uh, then there are non-residential planned communities. So you might have a completely commercial uh, community that you know looks like a common interest community, but because it doesn't include any residential real estate, Kiowa is inapplicable completely. There are out-of-state common interest communities, which is actually in the statute, which I found surprising that somebody found that necessary. Uh, and on, on second thought, well, you know, maybe it does make sense because what if somebody develops a community, you know, straddling the four corners down in southwest Colorado, then you would have, you know, a question as to whether Kiowa applied to, you know, the units that were in Colorado. Well, we have our answer. It would not apply if there's any part of the community that is outside the state of Colorado. And then uh, cooperatives also have some exceptions that uh, are, are similar to planned communities, but we're not going to, I'm kind of omitting the term cooperatives from the rest of the presentation for the most part. Okay, so the, the first big exception is the non-common interest communities. So, you know, when I'm, when I get a, a new matter on my desk and, and I'm trying to, you know, figure out you know, where we stand legally, the, the first thing I'm going to review is whether I'm dealing with a common interest community. And as I said before, um, you know, a common interest community is real estate described in a declaration with respect to which a person by virtue of such person's ownership of a unit is obligated to pay for real estate taxes, insurance premiums, maintenance, or improvement of other real estate described in that declaration. So as an initial matter, you, you need a valid declaration if you're going to have a common interest community. And at minimum, a valid declaration requires that you have a sufficient legal description of the real property. Otherwise, you, you know, don't know what property you're talking about, obviously. Uh, that declaration has to be recorded in the real property records for the county or, or counties in which that property is located. And the declaration has to be approved by all owners of that real property at the time the declaration is recorded. Now, 
ever since Kiowa came into effect in, in 1992, there are some kind of additional requirements that are in place for a valid declaration. Because Kiowa is very explicit about what it takes to have a, a valid declaration. You have to have notarized signatures from all of those owners of the real property. Uh, the declaration has to have the name of the common interest community and of the association, if there is an association. It also needs to have the name of each person who's executing the declaration. You know, you, you can't just have a signature line that says president of Richmond Homes and, and you know, a, a illegible signature. The, the actual name of the person needs to be on that declaration. For a condominium, you have to have a substantial completion certification from an engineer, a surveyor, or, or an architect. The declaration also has to contain a statement setting forth the maximum number of units in the community, as well as the unit boundaries. Uh, the allocated interests that will be used to determine who pays what portion of the community's expenses. And you also have to have a plat or a map that is you know, filed before, simultaneously with, or after the declaration. You don't have a, a valid common interest community until that plat or map has been filed. So if you have a valid declaration, the next question is, are you obligated to pay for other real estate's expenses? If the community has common areas owned by either the association or the owners uh, in undivided shares in the case of condominium, then yes, you're going to have an obligation to pay for other real estate. Uh, even if the declaration doesn't explicitly require you to pay, uh, courts have found common interest communities by implication by reasoning, hey, you know, the association owns these common areas here. There's an implied obligation for all the owners to, to help pitch in and pay for maintenance of these common areas. Furthermore, if the county assessor's office has categorized the common areas as common areas, then the value of the common areas is taxed by adding that value or a portion of that value to each unit owner's property taxes. So you're paying for the expenses of other real estate in that way as well. So that's kind of an, an easy box to check if there are common areas then you know if you have a valid declaration then there's common areas yeah you are almost certainly a common interest community i can think of one exception but it, you know has to do with a community that has common areas that pay for themselves essentially the second question oops uh, well, I uh, uh, went a slide ahead a little too quickly there, but uh, the second, you know, question you could ask is, are there mandatory assessments? Because you do have common interest communities where there are no common areas, but there are mandatory assessments. And, you know, those, that revenue may be used not for maintaining common areas, but perhaps for covenant enforcement, you know, making sure all of your neighbors are following the covenants. If you're paying assessments that the association uses to enforce the covenants, then you are paying for expenses related to other real estate and you have a common interest community. So moving on to the next slide, uh, is your community a, a CIC, an example of a non-CIC? is uh, 
sometimes you see these voluntary membership associations and oftentimes they're like single family home communities there's covenants and maybe an architectural committee uh, but there's no common areas that the association has to maintain uh, the owners and the association have enforcement rights and the association is funded by voluntary assessments and you know only those unit owners who pay their assessments are members of the association and only those members have voting rights uh, to elect the board of directors and those communities are not common interest communities because there's no obligation to pay assessments and those communities often have uh, difficulty getting people to voluntarily join the association and, and pay assessments uh, I've worked with a number of those communities who have attempted to uh, make ass assessments mandatory. So another example of a, a non-CIC, maybe, is something we're seeing more and more frequently now, and I call them party wall communities or you know the, the Denver row houses. And you can probably envision what I'm talking about, where you've got you know multi-unit buildings and uh, you've got instead of a, a declaration of covenants establishing a common interest community the developer will record a, a party wall agreement slash declaration uh, that does have some covenant covenants and restrictions but there's no common areas um, there's you know cross easements all over the place so that everybody's sewer lines can traverse you know beneath the neighboring lots and so that vehicular traffic and foot traffic can access all of the units and you know the owners have enforcement rights to enforce whatever covenants are, are contained in the declaration or, or the party wall agreement there's no association established and you know there's it's debatable whether these communities are common interest communities or not and it really depends on the details of each particular situation um, I think there's going to be some developments in this area one way or another whether it's in you know on the legislative front or through court decisions as to you know where do you draw the boundaries when you have developers who primarily are trying to avoid you know, potential liability for construction defect actions, setting up these communities uh, without associations and, and you know, claiming that they're not common interest communities. So, but for today's presentation, it's sufficient to know that just, you know, these types of communities supposedly are, are not common interest communities. Okay. So that, that kind of wraps up the non-CIC category. Um, and as a reminder, those non-CICs, Kiowa is completely inapplicable. So we're moving on now to pre-Kiowa communities. And pre-Kiowa communities, as I mentioned earlier, are those communities that were created prior to July 1st, 1992. And these, the, the pre-Kiowa designation is applicable to condominiums, cooperatives, and planned communities alike. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, significant portions of Kiowa are applicable though. If you look at the uh, handouts, there's uh, one that shows, you know, which provisions from Kiowa are applicable to pre-Kiowa communities and, and which are inapplicable. And the list of sections that are applicable 
is noticeably longer than the list of sections that are inapplicable. So I want to go through some of the notable inclusions, uh, provisions from Kiowa that are applicable to your pre-Kiowa communities. So it's separate tax, title and taxation. That's very important. Uh, make sure that you know the association doesn't have to pay property tax on the common areas uh, in a planned community and also saves everyone the hassle, the assessor and all the unit owners of sending each unit owner a you know, separate tax bill for their share of the common areas in a condominium community. Uh, there's also a number of public policy restrictions uh, set forth in, in sections 106.5 to 106.8. Those include, you know, the statutes that prohibit associations from um, banning energy efficiency measures such as, you know, clotheslines or solar panels or, you know, wind generators or, or there's also the prohibition against, you know, for restrictions on political and patriotic expression. Those are applicable to pre-Kiowa communities. The section on enforcement limitations and powers is applicable to pre-Kiowa communities, which is a very important section of Kiowa. It empowers the association to enforce the covenants through legal action to you know recover its attorney's fees and costs incurred in a legal action or you know even those fees and costs that are incurred before a lawsuit is filed it also sets forth the one-year statute of limitations for enforcing building restrictions and also requires that associations have a covenant enforcement policy if they're going to assess fines. Uh, the next section of note that uh, I wanted to mention was the public disclosure uh, requirements in section 209.4. Uh, that section requires associations to make certain documents available to all the owners on an annual basis. Oops. And then the next section of note is the section 209.5, responsible governance policies. Uh, many of you may know those policies uh, by the name of SB 100 policies. Those are the you know, policies that each association is required to have on you know, collections, covenant enforcement, running meetings, uh, board member conflict of interest, investment of reserve funds, uh, you know, conducting reserve studies, and a, a few more that I can't recall off the top of my head, but those are all required for all common interest communities other than the small and limited expense communities that we'll discuss in a few moments, um, regardless of, of whether the community was created before or after July 1st, 1992. Um, the next section of note is section 217, which deals with amendments to the declaration and the legislature diced this statutory section up. It is a rather large statutory section, uh, but subsections one and seven are applicable to pre-Kiowa communities. Uh, the rest of that section is inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities. Section 301 of Kiowa requires organization of an association. So, you know, in theory, there are unincorporated nonprofit communities that have never incorporated a nonprofit corporation. 
uh, Kiowa says that you need to do that, regardless of whether you were formed before or after July 1st, 1992. So this next slide is dedicated solely to section 302 of Kiowa, and that section is partially applicable to pre-communities. And again, this is a fairly large statutory section. It sets forth various rights or, or powers of the association, and the legislature excluded a, a few of those powers uh, from pre-Kiowa communities, but by and large, pre-Kiowa communities have most of the same powers as Kiowa communities do. Those include the power to adopt and amend bylaws and rules and regulations, to adopt budgets and collect assessments, to hire managing agents and enter contracts, uh, to terminate their management contracts for cause without penalty, uh, to regulate the common elements and to charge fees for using the common elements, the power or the responsibility to ensure that architectural control decisions are not arbitrary or capricious, the power to collect late fees, attorney's fees, and legal costs uh, resulting from unpaid assessments and other amounts, the power to indemnify board members and officers, the power to issue fines for violations after due process, uh, notice and a hearing, and the power to litigate. And that includes the power to litigate claims in the association's name, as well as claims for multiple unit owners on matters affecting the common interest community. And the next slide here is section 303 of Kiowa. This is another section that got split up a little bit. Part of it is applicable to pre-Kiowa communities, part of it is not. Uh, you can look at the handouts and I've struck through each of the inapplicable provisions in, in that handout, uh, the, the Kiowa for pre-Kiowa communities handout. So the most notable provisions that are applicable uh, are those that empower the board of directors to all receive the same information. And, and this is an issue that raises its head every now and again, uh, where maybe you have a, a board member who uh, starts communicating directly with the association's attorney. Well, you know, when that happens, steps should be taken to ensure that all of the board members, all of the directors can have the benefit of that advice from the attorney. Uh, that's one of the reasons we try to, you know, send communications through the manager if there is one, uh, so that that manager can ensure all board members are receiving those communications. Oops. Uh, Section 303 also says that committee members must meet the same qualifications as directors. And that is, I think, an important provision that often gets overlooked. Uh, you'll frequently have a requirement that the you know, directors must be members of the community, which excludes some people. So if you know, a husband and wife hold title to the unit in the wife's name, the husband in that community is in a, or ineligible to serve on the board. He's also ineligible to serve on a committee established by the board. Hey, Travis, I'm going to hop in real quick. Sorry to interrupt. I'm getting a lot of emails that uh, people can't access the handout. So if it's okay with you for just a minute, I'm going to grab control back again and share my screen so that I can help people um, find where the um, handouts are. I'll get right back. Right back. Just one second. Okay. So right here, folks. Oh, I don't, yeah. Uh, not sure if you can see my control panel or not. I don't think it's showing it on, on the screen. But on the control panel, folks, 
um, that's the little small box that should be popped up somewhere on, on your screen. Um, there are some tabs and the second to last tab says handout. If you click on it, you can expand it and you can see uh, all of the handouts. There should be five of them. So hopefully you are seeing that. If not, um, you will be able to get these from uh, the YouTube channel later today. All right, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Travis. Thanks, Thanks for letting me Yeah. And I, I, to be honest, Jeff, I didn't see the other uh, the little window on your screen, so I'm dragging it out on my screen now. Hopefully, some of you can see that. Um, but the, the handout tab is, is right down here, and there should be five PDFs down there uh, under that drop down menu for handouts. If you can find the uh, go to webinar. Um, control window. Okay. I, I promise you guys there's nothing that you necessarily need to look at from the handouts during the presentation, uh, but certainly worthwhile to, to take a look at it afterwards. So back to section 303 of Kiowa, uh, and the, the next provision I, I wanted to mention was the budget ratification process. And this is a recent change. I, I believe this change went into effect three years ago. Uh, Pre-Kiowa communities used to be exempt from this. But as many of you may know, Kiowa has a budget ratification process in which the association has to, uh, through the board, adopt a budget, then send out a, a copy of the budget to the owners call a meeting of the owners, and at that meeting, the owners have an opportunity to veto the budget. Well, that requirement is now applicable to pre-Kiowa communities, unless there is a cap on assessments. And most frequently, you'll see that, you know, the original declaration says assessments are limited to no more than $100 a month um, to be adjusted for, you know, by the consumer price index. And, you know, if you, if the board wants to raise it above that amount, then they need approval from a majority of the unit owners or, you know, 67%. Uh, so if there's a, a, if there's a cap and the association is staying within the cap, then they do not have to go through the budget ratification process, but otherwise they do. The audit provision is also applicable to pre-Kiowa communities. Uh, we, you know, oftentimes get owners asking about an audit, and I've very rarely been involved with one because you do need to jump through some hoops to get it done. Uh, a third of the owners need to uh, request that audit, and the association's budget has to be over $50,000 a year. And I think this is my last slide on the notable inclusions for pre-Kiowa communities and you know, section 308 meetings uh, leads the list here. And I, I think that's uh, an important provision of Kiowa. It obligates community associations to hold open meetings and to allow owners to speak at those meetings on any matter that is going to be put to a vote of the board uh, before that matter is put to a vote. Uh, Section 310 is partially applicable and it addresses voting. There is language in there on, on how to address voting when you have multiple owners of one unit. That section also requires secret ballot for election of directors. It says that proxy voting shall be allowed and it also provides the association's board of directors with some leeway in in how it you know reviews votes or ballots and basically says that as long as the board is acting in good faith you know they can reject a ballot if they don't think you know the signature is verifiable or you know, for whatever reason, they, they think that a, a vote or a ballot might not be acceptable, that they can reject it as long as they're acting in good faith. Uh, 
same with accepting ballots. You know, if they are accepting in good faith, then it's going to be okay. Then section 316, this is a very important um, section in certainly the work that I do with uh, judicial foreclosures. This section provides special lien priority for the association's lien against each unit for unpaid assessments and other amounts. And it's because of this section that the association's lien has priority over second deeds of trust, over you know, judgment liens from credit card companies or, or medical debt collectors. It also has priority over, you know, state income tax liens. So it, it's, you know, a very significant provision. It, it also gives a super priority lien equal to six months worth of assessments that is prior and superior to the first deed of trust on the property. So, uh, it's, you know, very powerful statutory section there, and it is applicable to pre-Kiowa communities. Section 317 on the association's records. Uh, that section is very detailed and outlines the records that the association is required to keep and also mandates that the association allow owners to inspect those records. That is completely and wholly applicable to pre kiowa communities. And finally, with a tip of the cap to Jeff here at DORA, registration, section 401 of Kiowa requires that all pre-Kiowa and Kiowa communities register with DORA. So some notable exclusions, and I'm going to try to step it up a little bit here and, and keep pace so that we can finish in an hour. But, uh, you know, there are some notable exclusions. And you'll probably notice that, you know, especially on this slide, a lot of these exclusions have to do with steps that would be taken when somebody creates a community. So it makes sense that a lot of these sections would be inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities because how can you go back and comply with a, a new statutory section when what's done is done? So we have, you know, unconscionable agreement avoidance powers from section 112 is inapplicable. Uh, that's the only section I noted from part one of Kiowa. Uh, the rest of these on this page are all from part two, you know, 200 and above. So, you know, creation of common interest communities, unit boundaries, the contents of the declaration, allocation of allocated interests, uh, limited common elements, Platt and map requirements, all those sections from Kiowa are inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities. The next slide shows exclusions from part three of Kiowa, and those include the, the power and the procedures to convey or encumber common elements. And in Kiowa, in section 312, does require that associations get approval from 67% of the owners before the association conveys or encumbers the common elements. And that can be a greater percentage if the declaration requires. Uh, so a pre-Kiowa community has to find that power somewhere else if it is to have it at all. Generally, you, you would look to the Declaration of Covenants to see if there's a specific power listed in the Declaration and perhaps a, a general power that you might be able to use as justification to make a conveyance or encumbrance of common elements. Next, the association power to grant easements, licenses, and concessions through or over the common elements. Kiowa gives that power to Kiowa communities, but not to pre-Kiowa communities. So once again, if the association is to have that power, it has to find it somewhere else. Most likely, 
in the Declaration of Covenants if it's going to have that power at all. The association power to assign future income. Now, Kiowa says that the association shall have the power to assign future income to the extent provided in the declaration. So, you know, really what Kiowa is saying is that you don't have this power unless it's in the declaration. Now, that's for Kiowa communities. Uh, you could pretty much say the same for pre-Kiowa communities. Pre-Kiowa communities might have a little more leeway because if you're a Kiowa community, you, you really need specific language authorizing you to assign future income. If you're a pre-Kiowa community, you might have more success using a, a broader, more general uh, you know, powers provision to justify a decision to assign future income. And some of you may be asking, well, why would we assign future income? And the reason you would do that is to secure a loan. Uh, some time ago, uh, lenders wisened up and realized that it didn't make any sense to get a deed of trust against an association's common elements. They're not really worth anything. The only thing the association has of any value is the right to collect assessments. So if an association is going to get a loan these days, the bank is going to want an assignment of the right to collect assessments if there's a default. The next section or subsection uh, that's inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities is Kiowa's prohibition against limitations on the association's power to deal with the declarant. And an, an example of a situation where that might be relevant is if you have a declarant who files some covenants that says the association shall use my management company, XYZ management company, as its manager in perpetuity. You know, that inhibits the association's power to deal with the declarant and it would be invalid under section 302 subsection 2 of Kiowa but that section only applies to Kiowa communities and you know as we get further and further from the effective date of Kiowa back in 1992 we're pushing on 20 years now uh, some of these provisions become less consequential you can imagine that you know, these provisions and their applicability or inapplicability would have been, you know, much more consequential to a community back in 1993 uh, than they are today. Nonetheless, uh, there are, you know, significant differences that, that persist. Uh, interestingly, uh, Section 303.1a uh, provides, you know, a broad you know, default power for the board to act on the association's behalf, that is inapplicable to pre-Kiowa communities. Um, most pre-Kiowa communities will, will have language to that effect in their declaration, but if not, uh, you, you could be in an interesting predicament because Kiowa's provision is inapplicable. Section 303 Two provides a limitation of liability for directors, and it essentially says that directors are not liable for any harm they cause to the association unless that harm results from willful or wanton actions. Uh, that section is inapplicable to pre Kiowa communities. Then, section 313 on insurance is inapplicable to pre Kiowa communities, and this has come up pretty regularly in my practice. And Section 313 touches on a number of issues. It sets some default you know, requirements for who insures what in a community that has horizontal boundaries. And when we say horizontal boundaries, usually we're talking about a condominium, but that's not always the case. And it requires a, a waiver of subrogation. Uh, against all the unit owners. So the association insures, you know, in a condominium insures the entire building and the units, you know, with a bare walls policy that may, might not cover 
cabinetry or appliances, but at least ensures that the entire building can be built back and be habitable. Um, that insurance policy must, by you know, the terms of Kiowa, include a waiver of subrogation against any of the unit owners. So if you know Tim Smith is microwaving forks and burns down the entire 20 unit building, the insurance company can't withhold 5% of the uh, funds for rebuilding the, the building because Tim Smith you know, intentionally or willfully or wantonly burn the building down um, and it cannot go after Tim Smith uh, to recover any of the uh, payout on, on that claim. The last subsection in, in section 313 that I'll touch upon is the allocation of deductibles. Section 313, in my interpretation, you know, it allows associations to assess a deductible to the unit owners who benefit from a claim and or those unit owners who negligently cause a claim, not to be confused with the waiver of subrogation that you know the insurance company has to grant, but you know, we're just talking talking about the deductible here. Uh, that has become you know a more contentious issue as deductible amounts continue to increase here in Colorado, especially. If you're a pre-Kiowa community, you do not have the benefit of that provision from Section 313, and I would certainly recommend you talk to your attorney about putting a similar provision in your governing document somewhere. And finally, Section 315 is addresses assessments and it's only partially applicable just a very small sliver of that section is applicable regarding you know escrow agreements stating that you know lenders can pay assessments through the escrow uh, on a mortgage if they want to that I've never seen that happen um, and the rest of section 315 is inapplicable and, and that section you know touches on you know assessing owners for expenses caused by their misconduct, it touches upon you know, use of the allocated interests. So if you're pre-Kiowa, you, you are reliant on your declaration and other governing documents uh, for those issues. So electing treatment under Kiowa. Pre-Kiowa communities can elect treatment under the full Kiowa and it must be a vote of the owners that occurs at a meeting of the owners. The meeting notice must inform the owners that there will be a vote to elect treatment under Kiowa and you need approval from 67% of those present in person or by proxy and you of course must have a quorum. Then you must record a statement of election with the clerk and recorder. An alternative to this process of electing treatment under Kiowa would be to just, you know, amend your declaration and mirror some of Kiowa's language or potentially in your declaration just say in the amended declaration that we're going to be subject to Kiowa. Uh, freedom of contract I think allows associations to do that without going through this statutory process to elect treatment under Kiowa but the you know threshold for electing treatment under Kiowa is lower in the statutory process because it's 67% of those present in person or by proxy, whereas an amendment to the declaration is usually gonna require 67% of all owners. So, you know, as I said, you could amend declaration to mirror Kiowa's provisions. Um, and that may be preferable to some communities because then you can kind of pick and choose maybe what you want to uh, utilize from Kiowa. That said, electing treatment under Kiowa would allow a community to modernize their, their community uh, by incorporating the full Kiowa with a relatively low approval threshold and probably a, a much less expensive process assuming you're using the services of an attorney to get the job done. 
and there are some issues that theoretically you might not be able to really accomplish through a, a declaration amendment. You know, there's some provisions of Kiowa that affect how the association interacts with third parties who are not bound by the declaration. Uh, so there could be some advantages to electing treatment through the statutory process in, in that respect versus doing a declaration amendment. And, and there's a, a list of those issues there. So the final uh, category here of you know, communities that are exempt from Kiowa are small and limited expense plan communities. And these, you know, notably, these exceptions are not available to condominiums. It's just planned communities. So a, a small planned community, and hang me, with me here, it's a planned community of less than 10 units if that community was created before July 1st, 1998, or 20 units if created on or after July 1st, 1998. The community must also not be subject to any development rights. And these small planned communities are only subject to sections 105 through 107 of Kiowa. Also, one of the details I'll mention here, if you have a small pre-existing planned community that is pre-Kiowa and they amend their declaration using some of the uh, sections of, of Kiowa that might be available to them, then they surrender their small status. That's a very obscure issue though. And then we have the limited expense plan communities. A limited expense plan community is a community where the declaration limits the annual assessments to no more than $400. And that does not include insurance premiums or optional user fees, like you know if there's a fee to use the pool over the summer. Uh, those are not included in the $400 cap, and that $400 cap is adjusted by the CPI from July 1st, 1998. And as with the small plan communities, these limited expense plan communities are only subject to sections 105 through 107. And likewise, these limited expense plan communities can surrender their limited expense status if they amend their declaration in a certain way. So these are the sections that small and limited expense plan communities are subject to. You know, the separate taxation and title, local ordinances apply. There's the public policy measures like, you know, you can't prohibit flying the American flag and you can't um, prohibit political signs 45 days prior to an election, seven days after, et cetera, uh, 106.7, energy efficiency measures, electrical vehicle charging systems, and uh, section 107 on eminent domain, dealing with what happens if the government takes some of the property. So, you know, there are, are some advantages, I think, with small and limited expense plan communities you know, they avoid all the obligations of Kiowa. There's a short list there. And then there's some disadvantages. You, you know, don't get the benefits of Kiowa by and large. Now, I didn't make a slide of advantages and disadvantages for pre-Kiowa versus Kiowa. Because really, when I started to think about it, it, it that's a tough call to make. Um, you know, the, the, the difference between pre-Kiowa and and Kiowa is probably not as big a difference as, as most people build it up to be. You know, most of the most significant provisions are applicable to pre-Kiowa provisions or pre-Kiowa communities. And those that aren't, you know, it, it's debatable whether it's an advantage or a benefit, I think. It, it depends, I think, on first what your existing documents say. And, and two, you know, what is your outlook on the association? Are you pro-association, pro-enforcement, you know, pro-association power, or are you in favor of uh, restricting association's power? So that said, with the limited expense and small plan communities, I, I thought it was easy enough to pick out some distinct advantages and disadvantages 
um, to accepting yourself from Kiowa. Finally, I made this flow chart here. Um, and this is a, a simplified flow chart, as you can imagine, after listening to me drone on for an hour here, uh, to boil it all down in, into a, a flow chart was a challenge. Um, but I, I, th I hope that some of you will, will find this helpful. Um, I, I'm not going to run through the whole thing right now because we are out of time. But I, I plan to, you know, I'll, I'll keep this handy for myself, uh, I'll confess. So I, I hope some of you find it useful as well. And now I will turn it back over to Jeff. Jeff? All right. Thank you so much, Travis. That was an excellent presentation. I'm looking forward to all of the wonderful comments I know I'm going to be receiving. All right. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Just one moment. Okay. Uh, so again, Travis, thank you so much. We really appreciate you letting us host you today. Uh, folks, here is all of our contact information. Uh, if you have any questions about the material presented today, please feel free to reach out with an email or a phone call. Um, the division also has some great resources on the HOA Center's web pages. If you haven't already, please sign up for our emails. Um, you want to head to our website and navigate to the bottom of the page where it says email updates and submit your email address. Um, please check out our YouTube channel. Uh, today's presentation, uh, as soon as it's done processing, we will be uploading that to our YouTube channel um, later today, as well as all of the handouts. Um, and while you're there, uh, please be sure to subscribe. Um, don't forget to check out um, Val Fotheringham's uh, website as well. They've got some great resources there. And thank you all again uh, for attending today. I'm going to leave this page up for a few minutes so everyone can uh, grab it. Uh, again, remember, it's available in the handouts, and it will be available later today via our YouTube channel. Travis, thank you so much again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Everyone have a great day. Thanks again. Bye.